Good evening, everyone. My name is Father Bob Gross, and welcome to my kitchen at St. Joseph's Rectory in Bellevue. Today is Monday. It is October 10th, and it's 6.12 p.m. And I'm coming to you from my kitchen because it's my day off. And um, But this week, Father Dave Ambrosi is away on retreat up in La Crosse. So I was here to have Mass at 5.30. I just got done with Mass at St. Joseph's here. And tomorrow we'll be having Mass at 6.30 a.m. because Brother Stephen, Deacon Loris, and myself are heading to Cedar Falls for the Archdiocesan Pastoral, um, Pastoral Leaders uh, uh, Study Day. And that begins at 9 in Cedar Falls. So we need time in order to get over to Cedar Falls from here. So we're going to have Mass at 6.30. So if you're feeling pretty spry in the morning, come over to Mass. We'll have Mass together. So tomorrow, I'm going to sneeze. I'm going to sneeze, maybe. <sighs> yep, I, I sneeze. Thanks. Um, tomorrow, and the way the rest of the week is looking, I want to do my Vatican II video tonight. And the reason why is because I want to talk about tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, October 11th, is the feast of St. John the 23rd. And it's this close connection to the Second Vatican Council. St. John the 23rd is the Pope that called the Second Vatican Council together back in 1950, 1958. And then it happened on October 11th, 1962. So tomorrow is the 60th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. There's going to be a special mass at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and Pope Francis is going to preside over it. So I thought that we would go over our, our portion of the Vatican II series today so I could talk a little bit about um, Pope John, John the Twenty-Third. So Pope John the Twenty-Third was born Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli and he was the fourth of 13 children to poor Italian sharecroppers. So he did not come from, from the noble um, class. And after, he, after seminary, he studied Rome on scholarship, and he served as secretary to a bishop. And then he entered into the diplomatic service for the Holy See, and he became a, um, a papal ambassador. And one of the things that he did during World War II was to save a number of Jews from execution by the Nazis. And... Um, he did a lot of beautiful things during his time as, as papal ambassador. Then he ended up as Patriarch of Venice. And then at the age of, uh, what time? He was 76. At the age of 76, he was elected as the successor to Pope Pius XII. And they thought that he was going to be a, an interim pope, just a caretaker pope that would go from Pius XII, who was pope for a long time, to, to the next pope. Well, actually, the Holy Spirit touched his heart in a profound way, and he um, convoked the Second Vatican Council. So what I want to do is um, pray his prayer, uh, his opening prayer for the Mass tomorrow, and then um, we'll go and continue our study of the Sancrum Sancrum Concilium, the document on, on the liturgy. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty, ever-living God, who chose blessed St. John the 23rd to preside over your whole people and benefit them by word and example. Keep safe, we pray, by his intercession, the shepherds of your church, along with the flocks entrusted to their care, and direct them in the way of eternal salvation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. St. John the 23rd, pray for us. St. Paul VI, pray for us. Blessed John Paul I, pray for us. St. John Paul II, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So we're going to continue our study, and um, on uh, the post are the paragraph numbers uh, for the part that we'll be looking over today. Uh, we're at paragraph 33 in Sancrum Sancrum Concilium. We're going through the document, and um, this is a very interesting part of the document. So it's subtitled, Norms Based Upon the Didactic and Pastoral Nature of the Liturgy. Okay, so how the liturgy teaches and guides the people of God. That's another word of saying it. 
Okay, let's uh, read paragraph 33. Here we go. Although the sacred liturgy is above all things the worship of the divine majesty, it is likewise, it likewise contains much instruction for the faithful. For in the liturgy, God speaks to his people and Christ is still proclaiming his gospel. And the people reply to God both by song and prayer. Moreover, the prayers addressed to God by the priest who presides over the assembly in the person of Christ are said in the name of the entire holy people and of all present. And the visible signs used by the liturgy to signify invisible divine things have been chosen by Christ or the church. Thus, not only when things are read, which were written for our instruction, but also when the church prays or sings or acts, the faith of those taking part is nourished and their minds are raised to God so that they may offer him their rational service and more abundantly receive his grace. Wherefore, in the revision of the liturgy, the following general norms should be observed. So paragraph 33 uh, enunciates and explains a very important uh, liturgical principle, and that is the law of prayer is the law of belief. Lex orande, lex credende. That's what it is in Latin. So the, the law of prayer teaches us what we believe as the law of our faith. And then in turn, that instructs us about the divine realities of God. Okay, that's a really important, uh, really important principle. So if you want to learn about what we as Catholics believe, look at how we pray. Look at the words we use to pray. Look at the gestures that we use to prayer, that we use at prayer, and look at the symbols that we use during the liturgy. So that's why the church forms. The liturgy forms the people of God. And it makes this point that first and primary, the liturgy is for the adoration and praise of the divine majesty. It's for worship. But secondly, it forms the people of God. And it does this through sacramental means, mediation in other words, that invisible realities are made present through visible signs. So let me give you a perfect example, water oil, bread, wine, laying on of hands. Those are the things that communicate and signify and they themselves possess the invisible reality, okay? So we always have to remember that are the symbols and the words teaching and forming and leading and guiding the people of God. And the Second Vatican Council, the church fathers, the bishop said, there needs to be a revision in order to make this much more clearly and much more guiding for the people of God so they receive all the treasures from the sacred liturgy. Paragraph 34, the rites should be distinguished by a noble simplicity. They should be short, clear, and un unencumbered by useless repetitions. They should be within the people's powers of comprehension and normally should not require much explanation, okay? So I'm gonna give you a perfect example from the traditional Latin mass, one aspect of the traditional Latin mass that was simplified in the new liturgy, okay? At the beginning of the traditional Latin mass, the mass of Pope John XXIII, the priest did the prayers at the foot of the altar and part of the prayers at the foot of the altar was the priest praying the confidier. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words and what I have done and what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. One of the examples of useless repetitions was that the priest would say his confidier, and after he would say the confidier, the people would say the confidier after. So one of the simplifications of the new mass, the revisions, the reform of the mass, the mass of Paul VI, is that the confidier is said together. The priest and the people pray the confidier and ask mercy for their sins through their fault, through their fault, through the most grievous fault. It's the same prayer, but it's not repeated. Another example within the penitential act, there used to be nine Lord have mercies, Christ have mercies, Lord have mercies. 
Now there is merely six. The priest says one, the people simply repeat one. We're still saying the Kyrie, Lord have mercy, but we simplified it. So those are one example of how the Mass of Paul VI was simplified so that we could follow and do the prayer together, the communal nature of it. It's not Father doing his Mass and we doing our Mass. It's one Mass together offering praise and adoration to God. That's an example of that. Okay, here's paragraph 35. That the intimate connection between words and rites may be apparent in the liturgy, number one, in sacred celebrations, there is to be more reading from Holy Scripture, and it is to be more varied and suitable. Number two, because the sermon is part of the liturgical service, the best place for it is to be indicated even in the rubrics as far as the nature of the rite will allow. The ministry of preaching is to be filled with exactitude and fidelity. The sermon, moreover, should draw its content mainly from scriptural and liturgical sources. And its character should be that of a proclamation of God's wonderful works in the history of salvation, the mystery of Christ, ever made present and active within us, especially in the celebration of the liturgy. Number three, instruction, which is more explicitly liturgical, should also be given in a variety of ways, if necessary, Short directives to be spoken by the priest or proper minister should be provided within the rites themselves, but they should occur only at the more suitable moments and be in prescribed or similar words. And number four, Bible services should be encouraged, especially on the vigils of the more solemn feasts or on some days in Advent and Lent and on Sundays and feast days. They are particularly be commended in places where there is no priest available. When this is so, a deacon or some other person authorized by the bishop should preside over the celebration. This is a profound paragraph. Four areas. Number one, the liturgy has to have more of the Bible in it. And do you know what the fruit of this paragraph is? Is the lectionary. A profound undertaking that was one of the greatest contributions to the life of the church. In the traditional Latin Mass, only one cycle of readings was used, which was a very narrow selection of the Bible. After the Second Vatican Council with the Mass of Paul VI on Sundays, there was a three-year cycle of readings, A, B, and C. And then for daily Mass, there was a two-year cycle of readings. So if you just go to Mass on Sunday uh, for three years and go every Sunday, you're going to hear about 85% of the Bible. Profound. So this then is connected to the preaching of the Word. Sermons are not to only be about morality. It's not to reduce Christianity to an ethical system, as Pope Benedict taught us. But it's to be an encounter with the very person of Christ. And that's what the homily, the sermon, is supposed to do. So it's supposed to lead you to an encounter with, with the Word of God, who then leads you to himself in the liturgy of the Eucharist at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Preaching has to be better Preaching cannot be an afterthought. It must be an integral part of the liturgy day in and day out. That was a wonderful renewal in the sacred liturgy. And I truly do think that preaching is so much better than what it used to be. I really do. Number three, the priest should be free to explain the rites when need be. So that the Faithful may enter into the mystery of those rites, prayers, and liturgies. And lastly, again, another emphasis on the Bible. When you can't gather for Mass, still gather and read from the Bible, the Word of God. We cannot be Catholic without reading the Bible. And it is so clear right now in this document on the liturgy that the Second Vatican Council wanted Catholics to be walking into church with their Bibles so they can understand the word of God and live it in their lives. There was a deficiency in the liturgy presently before the Second Vatican Council. It did not honor the word of God. And partly was because of historical context. There was such so much emphasis on the altar and the, and the holy sacrifice of the mass 
because of the Protestant Reformation. That's why everything was done at the altar to show that the altar was the most important place and in the center of the altar was the tabernacle, right? But when you look at the ancient liturgy of the church, it was equally being fed from the altar of the word and equally fed from the altar of the Lord's body and blood. You cannot have one without the other. The liturgy of the, of the word leads to the altar of sacrifice. This paragraph, number 35, I've seen bear so much fruit in the life of the church. It is a beautiful document, a beautiful paragraph that we have to continue to live. Okay, here's 36. This is the controversial one that many people who critique the imp implementation of Vatican II cite very oftenly, very often. So let's look at this. Paragraph 36. Particular law remaining in force, the use of the Latin language is to, preser is to be preserved in the Latin rites. But since the use of the mother tongue, whether in the mass, the administration of the sacraments, or other parts of the liturgy frequently may be of great advantage to the people, the limits of its employment may be extended. This will apply in first place to the readings and directives and to some of the prayers and chants, according to the regulations on this matter, to be laid down separately in subsequent chapters. These norms being observed, it is for the competent te territorial ecclesiastical authority mentioned in Article 22, which is above, to decide whether and to what extent the vernacular language is to be used. Their decrees are to be approved, that is confirmed by the Apostolic See. And whenever it seems to be called for, this authority is to consult with bishops of neighboring regions which have the same language. Translations from the Latin text into the mother tongue intended for use in the liturgy must be approved by the competent territorial ecclesiastical authority mentioned above. So Latin is to be preserved in the Latin Roman rite. The intent of the council was to keep Latin in the mass, but at the same time, it gave the discretion of how much vernacular was to be introduced into the Latin into the Latin liturgy by the authority of the bishops. So the phrase competent territorial ecclesiastical authority in our case was the Conference of United States Bishops. So what we call the USCCB, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. So it's the Bishops Conference. The Apostolic See the central authority of the Roman Catholic Church in Rome, give that authority to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. They were the ones who have determined the use of the vernacular language. Over the last 60 years, they have given the widest permission to have English in the liturgy. And the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops have followed the vast majority of the U.S. of the other bishop conferences throughout the world, which have allowed the mainstreaming of the vernacular in the use of the liturgy for the sole purpose of people to understand what they are praying, to understand what they are praying. That's the intent of it. Should we maintain Latin in the liturgy? The Second Vatican Council said, yes, we should, but it may be retained in different ways throughout the world, okay? Now, this is something that might be a sore subject for a lot of people about the use of Latin, but for the vast majority of people, this was a great moment of deepening understanding of the sacred liturgy and the Holy Mass when things became put in the vernacular so the common person could understand. People started to put their rosaries in their pockets and they started to participate in the liturgy. So instead of praying the rosary during the mass because they did not understand the Latin that was being prayed, they prayed the rosary before the mass. You can have both, okay? One thought that I would say, it is quite profound how there are many other countries that do use Latin more than the United States. And I think that does put US Catholics at a disadvantage. Now, this is my personal opinion. It's not the bishop's opinion or anything. This is my personal opinion. 
I do think it is good once in a while, seasonally, to use the different mass parts in Latin so people can know them. Because when you go to Rome and you celebrate mass with the Holy Father, many times he prays the mass in Latin so everyone can participate. So there's unity and diversity, but it's also beautiful when the diverse peoples and of the church can unite in one language. Now that has been the cause of many debates within the church, this paragraph number 36. Okay, so let's review then. This section of paragraph 33 to 36 were norms based on the didactic and pastoral nature of the liturgy. And it's rooted in this wonderful liturgical principle, church principle, lex orande lex credende. And that is Latin for the law of prayer is the law of belief, okay? And the law of belief is what guides us and teaches us and leads us to the mysteries of Christ. The liturgy should be enhancing that when we celebrate it. So that's why the church fathers and the Second Vatican Council, the council fathers, wanted to renew the liturgy so that connection would be better when we come and worship Almighty God at Holy Mass. I think that's all I wanted to cover. I thank you so much for listening to me. I pray that you have a very, very good day. Good evening, I mean. And we'll pick up next Wednesday uh, as we go into how do we adapt the liturgy for different cultures, okay? And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm really hoping you are starting to see the beauty and the wonders of the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. In many ways, Vatican II has not been allowed to truly teach us. We have to remove our agendas and let Vatican II actually teach us. I pray that you're being inspired by this wonderful event of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you.